off rehearsal. And you, young lady, you run up to your dressing room before you get killed. Uh, where's Neville? Come in. All right, Fred. Turn out those lights. To Britain in the liner Queen Elizabeth comes Charlie Chaplin after an absence of 21 years and this time he's brought his lovely young wife Una, daughter of American playwright Eugene O'Neill and their children. Geraldine is just six years old. October 1952. Chaplin arrives in England for the premiere of Limelight. This is the second time back to his native country since he left it in 1912. It's at this moment that he learns he needs an immigration visa to return after being denounced by anti-communist groups. He has always been reproached for not wanting to become an American citizen, despite having worked in the United States for 40 years and making his fortune there. When he left America a week ago, Charlie was worried in case our affection for him had dimmed. Londoners show him now that he need not have worried. We can never forget him or the laughter he brought into our lives. London welcomed Charlie Chaplin with open arms as he presented his new movie at a charity gala screening. Princess Margaret represented the royal family. 20,000 film fans crowd Leicester Square to bursting point for the Royal Command film performance. Although outlawed from the United States, he was openly welcomed in Europe by artists and royal families alike. At the Comédie Française, he was invited to take Molière's seat. In Villefranche-sur-Mer, he met his old friend Jean Cocteau again, whom he had first met in 1936 on a cruise to Asia with Paulette Godard. Wherever he went, Charlie Chaplin was hailed as the great creator he truly was. Britain's film industry pays tribute to Charlie Chaplin at a luncheon organized by the Variety Club, which does such good work for British and American children. My lords, gentlemen, barkers, kings, I hope nobody's left out. <laughs> I think it's sim symbolic of the hands across the sea America, the United States, wonderful country, and England, a grand, my country. Shot in Hollywood after the Second World War, Limelight, the movie Charlie Chaplin went on to present in Europe, provided a chance to search for his lost time. He reconstructed in the studio the London he had left before the First World War. The premiere of the film in London 1952 allowed Chaplin to show his wife the London of his childhood. He would not rest until he had turned every stone to find it. He was very poor his own youth. He was raised in enormous poverty, you know, my father. And uh, he'd go to London just to look at the, the old house he lived in with his mother that was a sad little place. And, uh, and he always felt, a, you know, he can't, couldn't help having a feelings about his old country there. Would talk, he'd, walk the streets sometimes and look, well, I used to go here and there, except that in, in that time it changed so much, it was difficult to say I, I grew up here. We 
It made me remember how bitter my tears were when I was 12, and I saw it for the first time. The same bitter taste in my mouth, the same emotions watching Limelight. I saw it again recently. I think we all suffer from some sort of emotional subjection to the movie. I know I do. Mrs. Allsop's out! Mrs. Allsop's out! It was all an evocation of, of the melancholy and insular uh, world of London that he remembered and both loved and hated, of course, because he, he had, as you know, been in um, a workhouse, uh, he and his brother Sidney, as children. I mean, they'd been completely destitute. And when you go to that part of Kennington now, which is now being gentrified, even when I was young, it was pretty dreadful. Headache? Where am I? You're in my room. I live two floors above you. What happened? Well, I came home this evening and smelled gas coming from your room, so I broke in the door, called a doctor, and together we brought you up here. Why didn't you let me die? It was a young English actress with a classical training, Claire Bloom, who was brought to Chaplin's attention. The Honorable Lady of the House, which is she? Speak to me, I shall answer. On Chaplin's invitation, she was to come to New York to do a screen test. He wanted me to bring a chaperone because he'd had quite enough trouble with young girls. So I came with my mother. When we arrived, very nervous about meeting Chaplin. You, you can imagine. Uh, he was at the airport to meet us. He was extremely beautiful. Wonderful white hair. He was very blue eyes. People always think he had dark eyes, but they weren't. Uh, these and beautiful, expressive hands. Um, uh, from that moment on, I was not frightened of him. And we worked every day, and then we went to uh, costumiers, and that was where he said to me, wear this shawl, my mother wore a shawl like that, my mother wore a skirt like that. And I realized he was focusing, horrible word, he was remembering and incorporating into the character both his mother and Una, his wife, and I think all the lost young women of his childhood. In contrast to the tramp who fell in love with young girls but was never loved in return, Calvero in Limelight, an older tramp, afforded himself the luxury of awakening in these girls the most tender of loves. If you remember the scene where they walk along the embankment and she says, I love you, that's all that matters. I felt so strongly that this was his wish. Us? Yes. Us. You and me. Together. She is lying. And deep inside, she knows she is. He knows Terry is lying, and we know he knows. It's all sort of staged. Calvero is overwhelmed by the affection shown to him at the end of his life. A 20-year-old girl telling this man of 60 or more Let's get married. I love you. However, the incredible amount of affection she shows him equals the amount of humiliation that Calvero must feel. He knows only too well that she would marry him out of mere pity, not love. His smile makes us cry. 
Chaplin had first of all written Limelight as a novel, Footlights, in which he had indulged in sentimentality. The story very gradually became a film script in which Chaplin rediscovered, through the story of a young dancer and an aging clown, the world of music hall entertainment in which he first made his mark. Animal trainer, a circus entertainer. I've trained animals by the score, lions, tigers, and wild boar. I've made and lost a fortune in my wild career. Some say the cause was women, and some say it was bear. <laughs> it was in the United States during a tour with Fred Carnot's troupe that he discovered a whole new world, the world of cinema. Not long after, he created the character of the tramp. My contract with the Keystone Company was for three pictures a week. <laughs> for the first uh, year there, I made two, uh, 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 two pictures in one day. Uh, they were too short, and uh, from, uh, for, that, for those extra pictures, I got $25. In less than 10 years, he is the leading personality in international cinema. Chaplin shoots film after film. From now on, he has his own studios and the world pays homage to him. He liked it. He had his own studio, his own crew, and uh, they were on salary. Now, they had good jobs. He'd call them up and say, boys, we're going to start. Uh, you no, know, everyone would rush to the studio. and. Uh, get the sets ready, and, and some people uh, stayed with him forever. Raleigh Talaroth, the cameraman, was with him on all his pictures. A few basic people stayed with him always. At the time of shooting Limelight, in which he brings to life a vanished world, he didn't know this would be his last American film. The film evokes a dream, but also belies one of Chaplin's greatest fears, that of losing touch with his audience. After being successful for 30 years, he abandoned the character of the tramp for Monsieur Verdoux, his most daring film to date, and was to know his first failure with his audience. The violent reactions towards Monsieur Verdoux coincide with the start of the Cold War. Chaplin becomes the most visible target among Hollywood people of the anti-communist crusade. Yet, Limelight was not a political film. Chaplin shoots once again in his own studios. As usual, he does everything. He supervises costumes and set, composes the music for orchestration, and is responsible for choreography. But for the first time, he plays death. It's you I love. The heart and the mind. What an enigma. Miss Teresa, you're on, please. Clearly, who's dying here is not Calvero, but Charlie Chaplin. That's all I wanted to say. I won't be long, my darling. I believe I'm dying, Doctor. But then I don't know. I've died so many times. Are you in pain? No more. Where is she? I want to see her dance. Wait a minute. Watching the end of Limelight again, 
I feel like crying. And it doesn't happen too often to me. With limelight, tears flow very easily. This is an interview. It would be unusual and quite embarrassing to start crying in front of the camera. But there is something else. What covers Calvero is not a shroud. It's not a hospital sheet. It's a screen. We have seen theater, theater, and more theater. What now covers him is not a theater curtain, but the movie screen. Chaplin is saying, there. Chaplin is over. Calvero, an image of myself, has got to die in order to allow youth, Terry, to flourish. This is the end of this sublime exorcism that is limelight. No, Limelight was not a political film. And yet, we call on United Artists to join forces in the fight with World Cinemas, Fox Cinemas California, Mr. Ward Bond, Mr. Howard Hughes, the American Legion, and all Americans to rid our country of people like Charles Chaplin, the person, and his films. There are terrible hideous letters at the end from the American Legion, um, et cetera, et cetera, saying about trying to get Chaplin and get him out. And, uh, but this was apparent even while we were making the film. He was always being uh, studied by the FBI. We all knew that. This is a list of the facts concerning the communist sympathies and activities of Charles Chaplin. Chaplin has been a USSR supporter since 1917, Daily Worker, May 1944. His first wife complained after the divorce of his socialist theories, which contributed toward the breakup of the marriage, no source. Chaplin and Catherine Hepburn were invited to a peace demonstration organized by the communists in the Ruhr. Frederick Joliot-Curie and the Bishop of Canterbury were also invited. Los Angeles Times, July 1950. Chaplin and Paul Robeson were honorary presidents of the Congress of Artists and Writers in Bucharest. Los Angeles Times, October 1947. In 1948, Hans Eisler leaves the United States accused of being a dangerous foreigner, and Chaplin states he is proud of his friend. The American Legion magazine, December 1952. To the question, why didn't you become a U.S. citizen, he replied, I am an internationalist. I am not nationalist because nationalism provokes wars. What of course nobody knew was that Chaplin would not be allowed back and that the film would not really be shown in America. It was only shown in very few cinemas. <laughs> All right, old boy, let's all go home. Yeah, you're right. Good night. Blast it, these shoes are too tight. He would never again work in the United States. 
After a triumphant tour of limelight premieres in Europe, he settles in Switzerland with his family. Twenty years later, when the political climate has changed, the Hollywood Academy offers him an Oscar for his career in filmmaking. Although invited by the establishment, the State Department grants him a visa to enter the U.S. only once, and he cannot stay any longer than two months. What can one say? One was enough for him. I don't think he had any desire to go back, ever. You know, it was too bitter. I was surprised in a way that he did go to get the Oscar, but I suppose it was the elegant thing to do. Bologna, July 6, 2002. At the Cinema Ritrovato Festival, the Bologna Film Library, which is in charge of the Chaplin Archive, presents a restored version of Limelight on the Piazza Grande. We are now in 2002. The movie, I think, was released in 1952. Fifty years have gone by. It's an important point because time is a central character in Chaplin's movie. Time and its mercilessness. Chaplin is so great that anyone can find their own niche in his work and be happy with what they absorb. There's always something new to discover in his work. imagine happening to me as a result of 50 years ago having made this film with such a great man. 50 years later, there are 4,000 people in the Piazza of Bologna waiting to see this great masterpiece. Viva Bologna and Viva Shalo. Thank you. again, Charlie, would you do anything different from what you have done? Oh, no. No, I don't want to even go back. I just want to keep going forward, forward, forward. 